Hi everyone, so welcome to the live stream today. Always a pleasure coming your way as we assist you to prepare for the for the August 2022 examination. And today we want to uh, look at some Q&A uh, issues and uh, deal with some of the challenges that you are having as we pounce down towards the August 2022 examination. So far we have two more weeks to go and uh, technically, in the next 14 days, you will be preparing yourself to write your first paper if you are doing corporate reporting or financial reporting for the August 2022 examination. Now, I see some of you joining. So put in the chat on the comment section for me. Any questions you have for me, something you would want me to share my thought on, I will really, really want to answer your questions for you and provide you with some assistance uh, today. Uh, let's see some comments coming in already. Uh, Edward Sikambali said, how are you, sir? I'm flourishing, Edward. Thanks for asking and thanks for joining us on the stream today. Um, Abdullah Babs Hussein said, hi, NP. Hello, Abdullah. Um, please, any videos for me to prepare for my PSA POS? What is PSA POS? What is PSA POS? Um, Abdul Harim Babs. Let me know what you mean by that because I don't know what you mean by that. Uh, let me know so I can provide you with some answers. Uh, in that case, I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. Uh, give us a thumbs up on the video when you join and also put in the comment section uh, for me any questions you have that you would want me to share my thought on. It's a live Q&A session, and so I want to answer as many questions as possible that I can as we prepare for the examination. So put in the comment section for me any questions you have. Let me provide you with some answers specifically. Okay, principles of taxation. So Abdullah, what do you want to know about principles of taxation? We have some videos on principles of taxation on our YouTube channel that you can check out on the channel uh, in that case. So, but if you have sp something specific, a uh, question that you would want me to answer or do you want me to, something you want me to explain to you in principles of taxation, why not? I will gladly do that for you. So if there is a specific question in principles of taxation or something you want me to talk about, put it in the comment section for me. I would want to assist you with that. I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. This is a live Q&A. So if there are any specific questions, something you would want me to share my thought on, just put it in the comment section for me. Put it in the chat for me. Let me hear from you. I'll bring up your comments and provide you with some answers as we prepare for the August 2022 examination with just about less than 14 days to go uh, in the first paper. Technically, you know, technically, I know we may have more days than that, but technically about 14 days to go in the examination. So, if there are any questions, you put it in the chat for me as we looked at uh, some of the issues that we need to discuss in the exams. Now, uh, like I mentioned already, by now, it means you are cruising into your revision session and starting to look at the various key issues that you have to focus on to increase your chances of passing the examination. So if you are doing a subject like or you are writing a subject like public, uh, sorry, financial reporting, then what are the issues that you have to pay attention to? Now, I have said this before, and I'm going to provide you um, with some ideas in relation to uh, the principles that relates to uh, that uh, issues, for instance, ratio analysis is very critical. But you see, there are various types of ratios questions that the examiner can present to you in the exam hall. So it is crucial for you to understand the structure of the various ratio questions that examiner can present you with. Number one is the default question that examiner can bring you with, where the examiner just gives you statements of financial performance and statements of financial position. And then that's all, or statement of profit or loss and statement of financial position. No footnotes. You will calculate some ratios and then you do some interpretation in that case. That is the default KG2 entry level introduction ratio that examiner can throw at you. Number two, the examiner can give you 
a question that may require an adjustment to the financial statements given before you can calculate the ratio. Now, that is the second type of ratio that examiner or ratio analysis or evaluation of financial statements that the examiner can present you with. So the first one is default. You are just giving financial statement, no footnotes, calculate ratios, interpret, and go away. The second thing is that the examiner gives you financial statement, provides you with some footnotes, then you would have to adjust the financial statement to reflect the footnotes provided, then you can now compute the ratios and then you interpret the ratio. That is the second part of the analysis that the examiner can present to you in the exam hall. The third type is where the examiner doesn't want you to lift a hand. So what the examiner would do is to present you with just the, ra the ratios, then he will ask you to present an analysis uh, in that particular case. So here you are not lifting a hand, you are not doing any calculation, but then you're going to be interpreting the ratios. And like I say always, interpretation of the ratios is very, very critical, is very, very important. Why is that? Because you see, it is not about regurgitating the ratios that have been computed, but it is about telling the uh, whoever we are writing to, and to be specific, telling the examiner the reasons behind the movement in the various ratios that have been calculated. So you don't just say, oh, the gross profit margin has reduced or the gross profit margin has increased uh, from this to this. It has increased by 70%. And so what? And so what? So you have to be specific on the reasons, on the rationale. Now, in case you missed that lecture that we did on ratios analysis or evaluation of financial statements, you can check uh, the channel on YouTube and you'll be able to get access to that video. We did a two-part video on ratios. Watch the videos, look at the way we computed the ratios and the way we interpreted the various ratios because that is going to be crucial for you as you go into the exam hall. Definitely, the examiner will present you with interpretation of ratios. So it is very crucial for you to understand how the ratios can be interpreted so that you increase the chances of passing the examination. So for instance, you calculate the current ratio. Okay, you did a current ratio and the current ratio is whatever, 1.5 last year and 1.2 this year. Then he said, eh, the current ratio has reduced from this to that. But this means the liquidity of the organization is good or oh, the entity performs better like the way some of my students write english now <laughs> i laugh at them a lot when we we do i ask them to write ratios analysis now i don't laugh like you know i'm laughing at them but you know we just laugh about that and if you look at the grammar people are writing it's just like geez Jeez. So it's very important you understand the structure of the analysis. If you are writing a report, the pro forma is going to be very important. If you are writing a memo, the pro forma is going to be important. If the examiner wants you to just analyze the financial statement also, the pro forma is going to be very, very important. So ratio analysis is crucial. It's waiting for you in the exam hall. As far as you're doing corporate reporting and uh, or public and financial reporting. That is a key issue. Number two is ethics. Ethics. There is a five or six months question waiting for us in the exam hall when it comes to ethics. So what in ethics must you look out for? What in ethics must you look out for? At this level, you must understand the various fundamental principles and also the threats to the code, to the fundamental principles. All right. But here you are not just regurgitating, oh, this is self-interest threat. This is self-review threat. This is advocacy threat. This is intimidation threat. No, 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 no. Take it easy. Take it pretty easy because it is important that you read a scenario. Then you identify the threats that the accountant is faced with in the scenario. Then number two, you can then link the threat to the uh, fundamental code of ethics that is being breached in the scenario. So that linkage is very, very important in presenting your answers when it comes to dealing with ethics, but it is a done deal area. So you need to practice a lot of questions to know how to read the ethics questions, but most importantly, know also how to answer 
the questions because identification of the issue in the case or in the scenario presented to us in the exam hall or by the examiner is going to be very crucial for you to increase your chances of ultimately passing the examination. So ethics, five, six marks, it is going to be there. It is waiting for you. It is smiling at you. You've got to be careful about that. You've got to be careful about that. So ratios, ethics is going to be there. Number three, the examiner is going to throw in there some theories on consolidation. It's going to be there. All other things being equal on that. For corporate reporting students, minimum of four mark question on consolidation is going to be there. And that will be the B part of the question three, which will usually be on financial reconstruction or corporate reorganization and business valuation. One of these guys will be there. Now, so the B aspect of that question will usually be a theory on consolidation for four marks or five marks, depending on how excited the examiner is. So as you do consolidated financial statements, be mindful of the various theories that are there how control is gained. The entities that are exempted from the preparation of, um, how do we call it, consolidated financial statements, okay? Why will goodwill be negative? And if goodwill is negative, how is it supposed to be treated? You must understand that. It is very crucial. So the various theories, how do we deal with investment and associate in the books of the entity, non-controlling interest? How do we measure it? How do we present it in the financial statement? So all these basic theories are going to be crucial for you to increase your chances of ultimately passing the examination. So whilst you are everywhere trying to learn the console, trying to do magic on the console, be mindful of the theories because the examiner is going to throw something at you relating to the theories and you should be in the capacity to be able to answer the question. So we have ratios, tick. We have ethics, ticks. We have theories on consolidation, four or five marks, tick. Then the examiner is going to be a little generous to throw some theory questions for you in financial reporting relating to conceptual framework, regulatory framework. The examiner may be generous to throw something at you there, qualitative characteristics of financial statements, uh, procedures involved in setting standards by the International Accounting Standard Board or the IFRS uh, Foundation. It is crucial for you to know these theories because the examiner can throw you some questions on that. So whilst you are again learning, you make sure that those fundamental theories, you understand them, you read them, and those things should be read, you know, like the theories on consolidation, conceptual framework, regulatory framework, those things, you read them. Then uh, if you are getting to start the exams or you are on your way to the exam or then you just flip through those things again, because those time, that time, you are just going to be learning the principles, memorizing those theories and understanding those theories so that in case they pop up in the exam hall, you will be able to pass the examination. Then to the big thing, IFRSs. 40 mark question waiting for you in the exam hall on accounting standards if you are doing financial reporting. 30 mark question waiting for you in the exam hall if you are doing corporate reporting. Now, how is this going to be? We're going to have a dedicated 20 mark question in financial reporting on the standards. Then the single entity financial statement, whether we are preparing cash flow statements or we are preparing statement of profit or loss, statement of changes in equity, statement of financial position, whatever be the case, 20 marks of that is going to come. However, each footnote, whether you are doing cash flow or you are doing the uh, statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, statement of changes in equity and statement of financial position, you are going to treat each of the footnotes per the accounting standards. Very crucial. So you're going to be solid on your IFRSs. Very solid. IFRS 15, you got to be solid. IFRS 9, you got to be solid. IAS 16, the OG, it is going to be there whether you like it or not. You got to be solid on that. IAS 12, income tax, whether you like it or not, go and hide anywhere you want to hide under the sea, uh, Wherever you want to hide, there is something about IAS 12 that will be in the exam hall as a financial reporting student. You cannot run away from it. 
Either the examiner will make it simple by looking at just the normal tax provision issue, or the examiner will make it a little bit, you know, interesting by bringing in deferred tax, you know, and that is where students begin to freak out relating to IAS 12, but you got to be solid on IAS 12. So IFRS 15, IFRS 9 financial instrument, very basic, very crucial, IAS 16, the OG, IAS 12, very basic, very critical. Then the other standards, make sure you familiarize yourself enough with the standards. This is 40 marks, guys, 40 marks. And like I tell you guys always, once I know something is coming in the exam hall, I'm gonna bury myself on that. So I know ratios is gonna be there. I want to solve all ratio questions in the various categories that I mentioned earlier. I know ethics, ethics is going to be there. Where can I get ethics questions and see the way the questions are solved, the way I ans answered it and the answer provided? Where can I get that? I know there will be standards there. Okay, how many of the standards must I know solidly with no excuses? It's going to be there. It's a done deal. Why would you fail? It's a done deal. It's a done deal. Then the last thing is going to be consolidated financial statements. Question one is going to throw us on consolidated financial statements. Now, if you're doing corporate reporting, there are some basic standards that you need to also understand. If you're doing corporate reporting, like IFRS 2, share-based payment, IAS 19, employee benefit, and then IFRS um, what else? IFRS 2 share based payment, IAS 19 employee benefit, IFRS 9 financial instruments. These three standards, all the three may be in the exam hall, or two of the three standards may be in the exam hall. Now, there could be a footnote in the consolidated financial statement or dedicated questions on them. Why wouldn't you learn it? Why won't you solve a lot of questions? What is preventing you from doing it? I hope you're getting it. I see some of you joining. Comment in the chat box any questions you have for me. This is a live Q&A. Uh, any questions you have for me, put it in the chat. It's a live Q&A. I'm providing you with some strategies, some key issues to focus on, how you can pass the specific exams, and also will be answering your questions. So if there are any questions, something in a specific subject, or you've been learning, you've been studying something, and you want me to share my thought on something, just put it in the comments or the chat for me. I'm going to bring it up, then I'll provide you with some answers. So that's financial reporting. But you got to be careful. You're going to have one enemy in the exam hall, okay? You're going to have an enemy in the exam hall. And who is going to be that enemy? Your enemy is going to be time. Your key enemy in the exam hall is going to be time. Like I tell students all the time, usually many students fail the exams not because they don't know, but because of time constraint. Maybe you write too much. Maybe you spend time doing things too much. So what I want you to do is make sure you train yourself. Make sure you work on your timing. It's very important. Do not start with consolidated financial statements. Some of you, corporate reporting and financial reporting students, I don't know what's wrong with you. Why would you want to start with consolidated financial statements? Who even said that? Whilst there, are, there is ethics there, you can take it out easily. There is ratio, you can take it out easily. There are theories on consolidation, you can take it out easily. Then the standards are there. You can take that, those ones out easily before worry your head on consolidated financial statements. So that is, that is my recommendation. Do not answer consolidated financial statement first. Because the chief examiner has mentioned, has stated that students usually do well in the consolidated financial statement, but they fail the exams. Why? Because they use all the time for consolidation. So you are doing the console, and by the time you realize you've done one hour, 30 minutes, geez, or let's say even one hour, you are on console, then they say one hour gone, and you've still not balanced your balance sheet, <laughs> balance your statement of financial position. There you start panicking. And you see, you got to be careful because immediately you start panicking in the exam hall. If you don't catch yourself as quickly as possible within the 10 seconds that you feel the panic, you are on your way to failure. Because when you start panicking, what happens is that 
your blood vessels are going to be pushing blood to your heart. So your brain is not going to be at its optimum best. And you're going to freak out. You're going to look like you've forgotten everything. You cannot remember anything. So your anxiety must be handled in the exam hall. I will not be there for you. Your lecturer will not be there for you. Your pastor will not be there for you. Your mother will not be there for you. You're going to be there by yourself. So in that three hours, your emotions must be in sync. If you start freaking out in the exam hall, your, you and failure are like this. You are like this because you're going to fail the exams. So be careful. No, and, and the reason why you will start panicking is when you answer the wrong question first. Maybe you thought you could do the console, so you start with it. Or you thought you could do the ratio, so you start with it. Only for you to now start calculating asset turnover and you are calculating capital employed, but there is a footnote relating to the way capital employed should be calculated. Then you sit down and you don't know what to say. You don't know what to do. That is where you start failing. So be careful. Take your time. Read through the questions and ensure you start with what you can do best first. And the deal has worked. Theories first. That is why the theories on consolidation, go answer it. The theories on conceptual framework and those things, go answer it. Ethics, it's not going to be too miraculous in financial reporting to answer or corporate reporting to answer ethics questions. Once you understand the principles, once you understand the concept, once you understand the approach of answering uh, ethics question, you could answer that question. What you are doing is you are building confidence for yourself. So you're able to answer the theories on consolidation. You're able to answer the ethics. You're able to answer the other theories. Then you are building momentum. Then you are building confidence. So by the time you start, you know, facing the challenging questions, at least you've bagged some marks there. Then you now begin to gather small, 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 put it together so you can increase your chances of passing the examination. So it's going to be crucial. It's going to be crucial. I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. This is a live Q&A session. I'm providing you with some strategies also on how you can pass the exams and put yourself in the position to really become successful. So put in the comment section for me any questions you have for me, something you would want me to share my thought on. Maybe you are studying something and you need some clarification. Just put it in the comment section for me for those of you on YouTube, or, sorry, on Facebook, or put it in the chat for me for those of you who are watching on YouTube, and I'm going to be answering your questions for you. I'm seeing some comments coming in. Let's see if I can uh, address some of them. Sir, please, what constitutes exempt supply? Exempt supply are, you know, supplies that are not subject to VAT. So, for instance, um, agricultural inputs, they are exempt supply, okay? Medicine, exempt supply. Water, sachet water, excluding, you know, bottle water but bottle water they are subject to excise duty because any bottle water you take you will see there is a stamp on it uh, that is the excise duty on locally manufactured goods so for bottle water it's subject to you know the vat the excise duty however sachet water is an exempt supply um devices needed or used by uh disabled people is also exempt supply then also educational materials exempt supply so basically essential products are treated as what exempt supply the reason is that if you put that again on medicine it will be too expensive for people to be able to afford it the thing is not expensive already probably your uh nhil it's not covering any of that thing. So if you could put that again on it, you're going to kill people generally. Agricultural inputs. You want to develop the agricultural sector and you want to tax the inputs, the medicines, the fertilizers, the pesticides, and all of those things. You want to put that again on it? Come on, man. You're going to kill the farmers. Then the issue relating to educational materials. Why the heck do you want to put a VAT on educational materials? People got to go to school. People have to be educated. And there are no money available in that particular case. So in order to provide some relief for people, these kind of supplies are 
referred to as exempt supply, so they are not subject to the VAT. So Abdul Karim Babs Hussein, that is what we mean when we talk about exempt supply. Let me know if that is uh, clear to you. And then any other questions, please put it in the chat for me. I want to hear from you with any questions you have. Nana Safo said, uh, said, please good afternoon and may God bless you abundantly for your good work. Amen. God bless you too, Nana Safo. Thanks for joining us on the stream. Uh, Yok Saudi said, good day, sir. Uh, watching from Kano, Nigeria. Thank you for joining us. You can share the video. Let us reach as many students as possible and the channel itself because there are a lot of videos on the channel that you can get access to to prepare for your examination. Stephen Ogundeji said, thanks for your mentorship program. God bless you. God bless you too, Stephen. Thanks for joining us. David Jemphy said, uh, sir, please, can you give us some strategy to pass financial management paper? Yeah. Financial management is also one of the interesting papers that you need to understand. The reason is that almost each topic is going to have a question coming in in the exam hall. It's like financial reporting. But the question is, the structure of the question, do you know? The answer is no. W what does that mean? Because we're going to have a question coming in in the exam hall on, you know, investment appraisal. So the various issues that relates to investment appraisal, you need to know all the methods of investment appraisal, the net present value method, the accounting rate of return, the break-even rate or the internal rate of return, um, the discounted payback, and then the regular payback. You got to know all the methods, then the capital asset budgeting process. So you got to know largely asset replacement cycle, you got to know largely sensitivity analysis. Now, so when it comes to investment appraisal, these are the areas the examiner can bring questions from. The capital budgeting process, the methods of evaluation, dealing with whatever method, then sensitivity analysis, then the asset replacement cycle. So the examiner can come from any of these areas for your question on investment appraisal, or better still, the merits and demerits of the methods of uh evaluation or appraisal of projects so you need to be able to you know understand this which one will come don't try to guess don't bother yourself to guess oh last semester the examiner brought this so this semester the examiner will bring that please that lotto time is no longer in icag like i tell you always you see icag exam now is advancing this is not a 2013 ica you knew or 2015 ICA where, you know, the structure of the question is almost like you can track it and it works. No, this time around, the structure of ICA question is getting better. It's improving. So every semester, the structure of the question is different. Yeah, it is the same thing you are looking at, but then the wordings, the terminologies, the, the verbs that the examiner use, the context of the questions, it's getting better and better. So don't try to, you know, predict exactly what is coming. No, just have an understanding of the issues there and spend time to look at it. Oh, Shira, you know, I don't have time. Oh, I want quick. Hey, hey, this is not fast food. Okay, this is not a fast food joint. The ICA exams is not a fast food joint where you can stand and say, hey, I want a uh, fried chicken uh, with jollof. And then you stand there five minutes, then they bring you the food and you go and eat. This is not fast food. You got to sit down and study. So if you're asking me strategy to pass, look at each of the topics. Working capital management. There is going to be a question on working capital management for you in FM. Where would the question be? I don't know. Management of trade receivables is, a, is an area the examiner can bring question. Management of inventories is an area the examiner can bring question. Methods or approaches to working capital management is an area the examiner can bring question. So you have to spend time to know each of the areas. Don't try to focus on something. You will have emotional trauma. Treasury management. Definitely there's a question on treasury management coming in in the exam hall. We don't know what it's going to be. Is it going to be tre uh, foreign exchange hedging? Okay, if it is hedging, what method of hedging are we de dealing with here? Will it be money market hedge? 
Will it be currency features? Will it be, uh, you know, the other methods like invoicing in home country or what? How is it going to be? We don't know, but we know there is going to be a question on treasury management. So you have to spend time to understand all the aspects of treasury management and solve enough questions on that. There is going to be question on time value of money. Where will it come? How will it be set? You have to know all the aspects of time value of money. If we put $10,000 in an account at an interest rate of 17%, you know, compounded semi-annually, how much would that be in 10 years' time? <laughs> That's a question the examiner can throw at you. Or we want to get $50,000 in five years' time. The interest rate is whatever, 12%. How much should we what, uh, uh, how much should we deposit at a uh, at a compounding interest rate semi-annually? The question can be anything. So you must know all the aspects of the discussion. So if you ask me what strategy should you use, my strategy will be know the key topics that the examiner will be setting questions on. Then in each of the key topics, understand the various dynamics. I don't know if I can put it that way, the various dynamics of each of the questions. Then you can pass the examination. Okay. So David, if you ask me some strategies to pass the financial management exams or paper, that is what I would say there as your strategy to pass the paper. Let me know if that makes sense for you. Uh, in that particular case, every topic, almost every topic in the financial reporting, financial management paper or syllabus will be in the exam hall. Almost every topic. But the dynamics of the question is going to be very different. So you've got to have your act together to be able to go through it. Any other questions, please put it in the chat for me. This is a live Q&A, guys. Put in the chat for me. Let me know if you have some things you would want me to share my thoughts on. I would really be excited to do that. Rachel Echo said, good. Okay, Rachel. Uh, sorry if I don't mention your name right. Okay, I'm sorry. Frank Dodu said, hi. Hello, Frank. Thanks for joining us on the stream today. Uh, what do we have? Rachel said, hi, sir. My question is different from today lesson. The question is that is format in preparing cash budgeting same as operational budgeting oh i don't sorry i don't understand the context of your question well uh but when you are preparing the cash budget i don't know what you mean by operational budgeting but when you are preparing cash budget uh maybe give me some context then i can provide you with a better answer but when you are preparing cash budget you bring in your receipts cash receipt, uh, whatever receipt you got during the year, then your payment will be brought everything on cash basis uh, in that particular case. So that'll be the format for the cash uh, budget. But when you say operational budgeting, uh, I don't know what you actually mean by operational budgeting because, I mean, the cash budget is for the operations of the organization. So maybe give me some context, then I can provide you with some better answer. Kwabena Ampo Amponsa Esong. Esong. Sorry if I don't mention it right, okay? <laughs> Please, can you brief us on how to calculate standard cost given budget and actual production and cost? Yeah, it's simple. It's simple. So can you brief us on how to calculate standard cost Giving production and actual production and cost. What cost is given? Is it because if you're calculating, you know, standard cost means the estimated cost per unit of a product. So if the budget is in total, the budget is all, will always be in total. Let me bring out my slide and then I'll show you some what I mean by that. Let me bring out my slide and I'll show you. Probably what I mean by that. Maybe you'll get it that way. This is what I mean by that. Uh, sorry about that. This is our presentation this evening on consolidation. But let me go back and uh, push up this slide here for you. So 
So if you are giving the budget information, maybe direct material cost, 10,000, direct labor cost, 20,000, um, direct expenses, 10,000, whatever, production overheads, 12,000, okay? This is the information you are giving. The examiner will give you the budgeted units, maybe 12,000 units. So if you want the standard, which is the cost per unit, you just divide the budgeted unit by the budgeted respective cost item, and that will give you the standard cost. So um, that is how you would deal with it. When you are calculating standard cost, you don't need the actual information. You don't use the actual information in the calculation of the standard cost. You just have to use the budgeted or the budget information the examiner has provided to you to calculate your standard cost. You don't use the actual information in calculating standard. You don't need anything there in the actual information. So you just have to base all your calculation on the budget information given to you. And then you now work on per pair because standard cost is the per unit cost for the product. The budgeted cost is the total. The standard cost is the estimated cost per unit of product. So um, let me know if that is clear for you, Kwabena, Ishong, and Ponsa. Let me know if that is clear to you. Um, Niger TV said, uh, good evening, sir. God bless you, sir, from Delta State, Nigeria. Okay, Niger TV, thanks for joining us on the stream today. And then Bini Perry said, good evening, boss. Great learning under your tutelage. God bless you real good, sir. Amen. God bless you too for joining us on the stream today. I see some of you guys coming up. You are welcome. Uh, this is a live Q&A session. So put in the chat box for me or the comment session for me. Any questions you have, something you would want me to share my thought on, something that, you know, it's on your mind and you want me to, you know, provide you with some assistance with, put it in the chat or the comment session for me. Let me provide you with some answers as we get excited with our discussion today. Um, David said, okay, thank you, sir. Always a pleasure. Um, what else we got? Mukuturi. Ah, forgive me if I don't mention your name right, okay? Mukuturi said, uh, good evening, sir. Can you please touch on amortization schedule table and the appropriational, sorry, and the appropriation journal, we, we have to know it's under lessee accounting. Okay, it's pretty simple. The way you prepare the amortized cost schedule depends on the, you know, payments that are being made for the period under review. So that is under IFRS 16, let's see, accounting. That is under IFRS 16, let's see, accounting. So payments can be made, you know, in advance. Okay, payments can be made in advance. Payments can be made in arrears. Now, we did a lecture video on IFRS 16. Mm? So, uh, let me see. Mukuturi, you can check the channel, the playlist, accounting standards, and watch the lecture video on IFRS 16. We did a lecture video on that. Uh, recently, just I think last week, Saturday or so, we did a live stream session on that. So, you can watch that video and 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 you will get the understanding of these things. But the issue is that if payments are made in advance, we'll have a balance brought, we have the year coming in, we'll have the balance brought forward, then we'll have the lease payments coming in, we'll get a capital balance, we'll apply the interest payable, and then we'll get a balance brought down. So this is A, B, C, and D. Sorry, A, B, C, D and E. Okay, so the way this works is that we will have, let's say, our first year, the opening balance comes, we will less the payments, then we'll get a capital balance. So the C here equals A minus B. Then if we want the interest, the interest is going to be the rates given to us in the question multiplied by the capital balance, the C, that gives you the interest, and then you get a closing balance. Now, what is going to happen is that this interest goes to the PL accounts. This is what will go to your PL accounts. The interest for the year. That is what will go to your profit or loss account as the finance cost. Okay. Then this closing balance here 
must be split into current liability and non-current liability. Okay, it must be split into current liability and non-current liability. How do you do the split? Because payment is made in um, advance at the beginning of the year, the current liability will be the annual lease payment. Okay, whilst the non-current liability will be the balancing figure. Will be the balancing figure. So this balance you got here minus the annual payment and that gives you the balancing figure that becomes the non-current liability so that is the schedule if we are making payment in advance okay but if we are making payment in arrears meaning at the beginning of the year we'll have year we'll have balance brought forward then we'll bring in our interest then we'll bring in the lease payment that we are making or the annual installment then we can get a closing balance balance brought forward Sorry, balance brought down like this. So if the payments are made in arrears at the end of the year, then this is going to be, we apply the interest implicit in the lease, we less our lease payment and we'll get a closing balance. Again, this closing balance must be splitted into current and non-current. So how do we do the split? Here, because payment is made at the end of the year, you have to do, do the schedule for another year so that you can get a current and the non-current so you will do the schedule for another year so even though you are preparing the financial statements for year one you will do the schedule for year two as well the closing balance for year one becomes the opening calculate your interest get your lease payment and then you now get your closing balance for the second period now what happens is that the closing balance for the second period becomes the non-current liability. Then the difference between the first and the second is the current liability. Does it make sense? So that is how we prepare the schedule. Again, here, the interest for the year is what goes to the PL account. The interest for the year is what goes to the PL account. So that is how the amortization schedule is prepared under let's see accounting in IFRS 15 when we are asked to do. Like I said, you can watch the full video on the channel under the accounting standard series. We covered that recently in a masterclass. So you can check it out and then you will get the principles. We solved some questions as well, I think so. And you can look at that in that case. So that is it about how we present that. Let me know if you understand that very well uh mukuchuri sir please can you do something brief on psa what's on psa there are a lot of things on psa can you be specific what exactly on pfa did i say pfa psa would you want me to uh share my thought on so maybe ask me something specific psa is a broad thing so ask me something specific then he said thanks so much sir you are so amazing thank you dennis then who else we got? Awo Konedu Amankwa Yaboa said, what strategy would one use in studying business management and information system? That's an interesting paper in level one, practically all theories in that particular case. Again, it's a reading paper. So you must know everything in it. Now, what strategies do you need to pass it at the end of the day? Number one, you must know the basic concepts available or the basic modules. Let me put it that way. There are a lot of modules in business management and information system. So make sure you know all the modules very well. But most importantly, know the way the modules apply in the case study scenario and how we usually use it. The pistol uh, framework is going to be fundamental there. Make sure you know it. Make sure you understand it pretty well. Then the various other modules that are going to be there, the organizational structure, then the IT aspect, um, you know, the issue relating to, I want to remember this thing specific, data processing, okay, data processing issue, the executive and the various other systems that are available. So my take for you or my strategy for you is because it's a reading subject, it means that you need to spend a lot of time 
with the paper, with the contents, with your books. Then as you read, you make sure you prepare your summary notes on your own. Okay? Make sure you prepare the summary notes. But ensure that you understand the key aspects of the syllabus because almost everything in the syllabus is going to be asked by the examiner. So the key modules, you must understand. Issues about leadership, you must understand. Issues relating to uh, the operational systems I spoke about, you must understand that, how they are developed, how they are implemented. You must understand that. So spend time to understand, one, the key modules and how they are applied. Number two, make sure you spend time to understand the IT aspect well very important because that is going to help you to really, really pass the examination ultimately in that case. So I will um, that is what I can uh, say in relation to that. I want to see uh, something and then I can, I can just give you an example of what I'm trying to say. Um, if you check, for instance, the please, if you are referring to the ICAG past questions under the syllabus, refer to the questions for, you know, educational purposes. Not necessarily that the examiner will bring the same questions. We don't do that. The examiner, I'm saying we like I'm part of it. I'm not part of it. Uh, but the examiner is not going to do that. Okay, so you're just reading it for, you know, uh, structure how the question is like but every semester every exams diet the examiner tries to bring something new in that particular case so that's it about that uh i will connect do like i said focus on the key modules make sure you're strong in issues in relation to marketing make sure you understand issues relating to the it you know aspect very very critical because all these things are going to be very basic there if you like you can just check just, just for idea purposes, check across board from 2019 when this exams or this paper was implemented or this syllabus was imp implemented and look at the structure of the questions. There is no repetition, but just look at the structure of the questions and see the coverage areas. It's a reading paper and many people don't like to read. So it becomes a little bit challenging, but you have to sit down and focus on the key modules and the key concept to be able to pass the examination because there are a lot of modules in uh, business management and information system. Like I said, the pistol framework, the balance call card, the BCG metrics, there are a lot of modules there. Make sure you understand them and how they are uh, applied. And I believe you are attending lectures, so you should be able to uh, have some key understanding. Mukuturi said, amazing, much appreciated, always a pleasure. Sir, please, I mean an overview on PIFA framework. That's a whole lot of discussion to be gone. We have a video on the on the channel on PIFA that I did. I think I did a two-part video on PIFA. So you can check the playlist on the channel on, you know, public sector on, uh, how do we call it? On, on the PIFA. I think we did a two-part video on that uh, around last year or so, if my memory serves me right. But it's it's PIFA related, and you can watch that to get a full overview. But the idea is that all other things being equal, there will be there, there is going to be a question about PIFA in the exam hall. The reason is that the PIFA is a framework used to analyze the performance of the public financial management system of the government. Okay, so that is the module that we use to analyze the performance of government. So, for instance, when it comes to issues relating to uh, evaluate performance evaluation, uh, which is one area we are going to be having questions in, there are three modules or three ways we can assess the organization's performance. We can use common size analysis. We can use the, uh, how do we call it? Variance analysis. Then we can use, sorry, ratio analysis. Then we can use budget variance analysis. So, we have common size analysis. We have ratio analysis, then we have the budget variance analysis. That part of budget variance analysis, we're going to be using the PIFA indicators to really do the, interp the interpretation. So there are seven pillars of the PIFA that you must know about. Primarily, one of the key areas or one of the key pillar is budget reliability. 
So for instance, government budgets that they want to spend $10 million on a project. At the end of the year, how much did they actually spend? Did they actually spend on the project? We would have to uh, look at it and analyze whether government is having good fiscal policy or poor fiscal policy in that particular case. So for instance, if we use PIFA to assess this present government's uh, performance, you will understand issues about budget reliability. You understand issues about whether the public financial management systems of the country is working effectively or not. So that is the idea about the PIFA. It is a module we are using to assess the efficiency and effectiveness, technically the strength of the public financial management system implemented by a government, in this case, Ghana. Make sure you go through the seven pillars, understand the seven pillars uh, very well. It's a written area the examiner can ask you a question on. Then make sure you understand how to use the PIFA indicators to analyze the financial performance or financial position uh, of, of a, a question presented to you. You can see a sample of that kind of question, um, I think, in the April 2022 examination also. Uh, April 2022 exams. I don't know if my memory serves me right, but either April 22 or November 2021, you'll be able to see a sample of that question where PIFA is called on to assess an organization's uh, performance, really. Yeah. To assess an organization's performance. So these are the things that you must understand in that particular case. Any other questions for me, please? Awo Konedu Amankwase, thanks a lot. Always a pleasure, Awo. Always a pleasure. So any other questions for me? Let me know. Any other questions? So what are we saying? What I'm saying is that in the next 14 days, hell must break loose on you. And you must put in the effort and, you know, come in with your best feet to be able to pass the examination. Like I said, the exams is not a fast food. Some of you, you are waiting to attend all manner of intervention classes. Yes, intervention class is good. But don't think that you're going to attend an intervention class and miraculously you will go and pass the exams. You have to sit down to study. You have to work on yourself. You have to have a deeper understanding of what you are studying. So yes, go attend your intervention classes, but make sure you understand what you are learning because in the exam hall, you are alone. If there is a question on ethics, if you don't understand how ethics questions are answered, how ethics questions are framed, the various verbs that the examiner will use and how you approach the questions, no matter the questions you solve, you will get the ethics wrong. If there is a ratio question presented to you and you don't understand how ratio is computed, you don't understand the interpretation and you have never written any ratio interpretation yourself, as at now that you are going to write the exams, I don't know what you're going to do in the exam. Or you're going to fail. So sit down and study. Sit down, practice a lot of questions. You are attending lectures. Good. You are, you are going to attend all manner of intervention classes. Good. But you must sit down and understand the thing for yourself. Practice a lot of questions. But a lot of you, because, I mean, you think you are busy than, uh, you are busier than Akufuado, uh, you don't do anything. <laughs> my, myself in my main class, I've had students who have never participated in any assignment, have never participated in any performance evaluation test. And then you ask yourself, so what the heck are you going to write in the exam hall? Because you have not tested yourself. Okay, you've not tested yourself. It's like football. It's like uh, Messi, Ronaldo. These guys are on top of their game, but they train every day like hell. Why do they train? Why won't Ronaldo just sleep and match day? Then he goes and play. He will flop. He will be disgraced. His team will fail or will lose the match. 
but you are running your life like you're an expert, but it's not good. So I will tell you this. You are attending lectures. Awesome. You will attend all manner of intervention classes. Good. But make sure you sit down on your own to understand the concept, to understand the principles, to solve a lot of questions. That is your ticket to pass the exams. That's your ticket. And many of you, you don't even know your problems. But there is a favorite quote that my friend, a friend of mine shared with me. He said, he who knows not and does not know he knows not is a fool. But he who knows not and knows he knows not is wise. He who knows not and does not know he knows not is a fool. But he who knows not and knows he knows not is wise. And that is what I want to leave you with. Don't carry yourself as you know anything, Ama. Don't carry your, yourself as you, you can just sleep and wake up and go and write the exam and pass. You will fail. And some of you, you've written the paper over and over and over again. Why? Because you are lazy. That's all. That's all I will tell you. You are lazy. So up your game in this August, in the next two weeks. Let hell break loose on you. Reduce your sleep. Do something. Do Just bury yourself. And chatter as soon as possible. All right? So that's what I would say. Some questions coming in. Let me take it quickly. Then he said, Hello, sir, just help me on how to correct errors for this transaction. Repayment to creditor had been recorded by debiting the bank account and crediting the creditor account. Yes, yeah, so all we do is to now come in. We will double the figure. Okay, so you double the figure. Then you come and credit the bank account and then you debit the supplier's account. Do you understand that? Dennis, let me know if you understand. You double the figure, then you now come and credit the bank with the double figure, and then you debit the creditor's account. It will correct the original entry, then it will now bring the entry into the books. That is why we double the figure, so that the first one will cancel the error, then the second one will reflect the transaction. Let me know if that makes sense for you. So double the figure, whatever figure that was the repayment to the creditor and credit it back to the bank and then come and debit the supplier's account. That is how we correct such an error in that case. So that is like error of complete reversal, I think so. Instead of debit, we credit, and instead of credit, we debit. So it's an error of complete reversal. So you double the figure, and then you reverse it to the original. Then it should be good. So please, in past questions playing, is past questions playing any significant role in the new syllabus? What do you mean by, Frank, what do you mean by past questions playing significant role? What do you mean? Like referring to past questions and solving past questions? I don't know. Please pr provide me with some clarity here, Frank. Uh, let me know if that is what you mean. Like I said, if you are referring to the past questions, refer to it for academic purposes, knowledge purposes. But the trend, the structure of the question is going to be different in your diet. And that is what the examiner is doing. The quality of the ICA exams is now getting up there. The structure of the questions is now getting up there. Predicting and lottery is not going to be the winner. So if you are referring to using the past questions to study, what I would say is refer to it, have the understanding for it. But the key thing I will tell you is know the fundamental issues in each of the subjects you are writing. Know the fundamental topics in each of the subjects that you are writing. If you know that, I can guarantee you, you will be able to go in there and pass the exams. I tell people this, I don't care the question that the examiner asked that last semester or last two semesters. I don't care about it. What I care about is 
If I'm doing public sector, I know there will be a question on procurement. If I'm doing public sector, I know there will be a question on PIFA. If I'm doing public sector, I know question 1A of public sector is going to be on conceptual framework and regulatory framework. If I'm doing public sector, I know financial statement will be there. What financial statement will be there? I don't know, but I know there will be a financial statement, maybe on the central government, maybe on the local government, or another covered entity. It could be a school, it could be a hospital, it could be a department. I know it is going to be there. So what do I do? I must solve questions in all of these areas. So I will solve question on final account on consolidation, consolidated fund. I will solve question on final account for a local assembly. Then I will solve questions on final account of other covered entity, a hospital, uh, and other schools, a department, or something like that. So I don't care what the examiner brought last semester. I don't care what the examiner brought last two semesters. I know final accounts will be there. So I just have to know the principles of preparation of financial statements for public sector entities. Once you solve questions in these areas, when you go to the exam hall, you will not be surprised. You will not be shocked because you have had knowledge on all the three. So whichever is there, you just pick it up and you start laughing and you answer the question and you pass the exam. That's my strategy for you guys. That is my approach for you guys. That is the recommendation. Don't sit down and try to find out, oh, what is coming? What is coming? That is laziness. That is foolishness. You cannot sit down and say what is coming. No, go to the syllabus, cover the syllabus. Make sure you understand the structure of the exams. Once you understand the structure of the exams, work towards it so you don't be surprised you don't get surprised in the exam hall because some of you will go to the exam hall and you'll be surprised because someone told you something that oh this thing will come oh this thing enfa enfa man how enfa all right and check the average pass mark check it so just bury yourself in the book understand the various aspects and the structure of the exams and solve enough questions from various sources. The ICA question bank, you know, is there. You can get it. Get the ICA question bank. It's there. You can get it. Get some other questions from various other sources. Go through them. That's the only way you pass the exams. So that is what I would recommend to you. Cover the syllabus cover by cover and know the structure of the exam very well. If you do that, you can position yourself to pass the examination. So in the next two weeks, that's all I want you to do. Don't be looking for what is coming in the exam hall. Don't try it. Don't try it. Because it, you will be shocked. You will be shocked. You'll get to the exam and be like, yeah, I'm fat. Yeah, I'm fat. Because the examiner doesn't owe you any duty. As far as the thing is in the syllabus, he's under obligation to bring it. So just cover the syllabus well. Sit down and study. And I know you can pass the exams. So that's what I would say there in that particular case, uh, in that regard. Eidu, Emmanuel said, good evening, sir. Good evening, Eidu. So that is it about that. And uh, I'm going to conclude around here today. Um, as uh, we resume possibly next week to solve some questions on some specific issues as we go into the exam coming August 2022, 14 more days to go. Sit down, study, understand the concept very well, and uh, don't wait three days to the exams and start being serious, four days to the exams and start being serious. Be serious now. And I can guarantee you, you will pass the examination. So that's it about that. Thank you very much for joining us on the stream today. Richard K. Tete, Ben Divine Favor, Eric Ahiadeki, Abdullah, Abdul Karim, and then Ame Abu. Thank you very much for the heart and thumbs up on Facebook. And thank you guys also on 
YouTube with a thumbs up really helps us a lot to promote the channel. So I will see you next week, Monday, uh, as we continue with our discussion uh, to prepare for the exams. But the thing is that the honors lies on you. Spend some time to study and you will pass the exams. So that's it about that. I'll catch you same time next week as we continue with our discussion. Have a great weekend and continue to study. Bye-bye.